You're listening to Boobies and Newbies, brought to you by the Frolic Podcast Network. This episode is sponsored by the most eligible Viscount in London, the latest release from USA Today bestselling author Ella Quinn. The most eligible Viscount in London marks the second book in Quinn's Lords of London trilogy, though you can absolutely read each book as a standalone. I have got one word for you. Pining. That's right. If you are a sucker for a pining hero who will do everything in his power to try to avoid his feelings and instead follow his head, you will fall in love with the Viscount Gavin Turley. I love how Eloquin spins traditional gender roles on their head in this book. The hero is in love but refuses to admit it to the heroine. The heroine's convinced that the hero is only looking for a marriage of convenience. And of course, what is a Regency romance without a meddling grandmama? Eloquin is a best-selling author of smart, spicy Regency romances, and I have to say, the most eligible Viscount in London is no exception. Please, please, please do yourself a favor. Pick up a copy today and get down to reading. And now, back to the show. podcast that asks novice romance readers to think outside the dick in a box and brave the unbridled world of erotica. I'm your host, Kelly Reynolds, and today marks my very first podcast as a 30-year-old woman. That's right, I turned 30 last week. Hopefully, y'all have been keeping up with my 30 flirty and reading giveaways on Instagram, 30 books by 30 authors in 30 days, all April long. And seeing as we're only halfway through the month, I can tell you that there are still a bunch more books to give away, and it's all going down on our Instagram. So definitely make sure you're following at Boobies Podcast on Instagram for all the latest and greatest in our giveaways. And while you're at it, if you're thinking, hmm, Kelly, what could I possibly get you to celebrate this momentous birthday of yours? Well, listener, I'm glad you asked. There are a couple things I absolutely would love for this birthday, and starting with a review on Apple Podcasts. Independent podcasters treasure your reviews because it makes our podcast easier to find for new podcast listeners. So that would be fantastic. Also, while you're at it, please, please come on over and join the Boobies and Newbies Patreon family because we have a lot of fun every month. I give away a lot of cute stuff. So those are just a couple of things that if you would like to help me celebrate 30 trips around the sun, I would absolutely appreciate that. Other than that, please just keep listening to the podcast. I love knowing that there are people out in the universe somewhere listening to this. It's why I make it in the first place. So for today's episode, I will say that today's guest is by no means a romance newbie, but I couldn't resist inviting her on to join me anyway. You know her as the host of the Romance Romp podcast and, of course, an avid reviewer of romance. Please join me in welcoming the lovely Keeney Allen. Thanks so much for having me, Kelly. I'm really excited about this. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited too. And I'm kind of wondering about how it took this long for me to get you here on the podcast, which I think is my fault, you know, completely. (laughs) It's okay. And I'm notoriously bad at like pitching myself, even to like friends to say like, hey, let me come chat about whatever. So, you know, we'll say it's both of our faults. I totally get it. What is it about that? Like, I just just now saying that I wanted people to like join Patreon and review the podcast. I mm-hmm. felt like I was I was asking for so much. Like, what is it that holds us back from like you know telling people to pay attention to us? <laughs> I don't know because I'm so great about saying like, oh, go listen to my friend or yes. read my friend's book or or whatever. And then I'm also like, oh yeah, I guess I do a couple things too. So 
<laughs> one day. One day we'll get better at it. I'm the same way. And I don't know if it's like a like a fear of sounding like conceited or or what, but I, I'm the same way. I just I always want to promote other people's stuff. And then mm-hmm. when people say like, oh, you're doing great work with the podcast, I'm like, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I blame the patriarchy. Mm, yeah. That's so. that's a good go-to for like just about anything. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that whole ingrained be nice, don't be too boastful, don't – you know, all those things. Be so. humble, smile, be mm-hmm. quiet, be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. All those things. So oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a good, it's a good, good world we live in. But mm-hmm. oh man, Keeney, obviously you are no newbie to the podcast, but I'd love to hear more about your podcast because that was actually something that was brought to my attention more recently, and I'm still, I, I still need to go back and listen to all the episodes. So uh, tell me about romance romp. Sure. So in 2015. I was working for my local newspaper here and where I live and they wanted to do kind of a um, like a for lack of a better term a quote like shark tank kind of thing. Okay. We were looking for new avenues of reading reachers or, or reading reaching readers or markets that we weren't already serving. So I was like in the back of my head had always kind of been thinking about doing a like romance um event like a convention or a book fair or something to that nature but um as we are sometimes want to do i'm like nobody cares about this it's Mm. a stupid idea blah 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 and my therapist at the time i was telling her about it and she was like if you don't go home and work on this and present <laughs> it, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's a dumb idea. And she was like, first of all, no, it's not. Second of all, stop telling yourself that it's a dumb idea and that you can't do it. And I was like, excuse you. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. And so like, I threw myself into it and I put together basically a business plan and like a whole presentation on like who a romance reader is, how much money they make, um, you know, that they're college educated. Yep. All these things. And most of them are married, you know, all the stuff I'm sure you know. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to do this presentation about bringing like a romance book fair slash convention to Frederick where I live. And I stood up in front of like our executive board, which were all men, plus one woman, because like Mm. two days before I was like, oh my gosh. I told my boss, I was like, there's only men on this panel. That's not fair, you know, like yeah. at all. So my boss at the time, she she ended up joining like the executive judges or whatever. So I stood up there and outed myself as a romance reader and told them all about it being a billion dollar industry. And our publisher was like, hold up, stop. You mean – Billion with a B. And I was like, yep, mm-hmm. billion with a B. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so it was like a judge contest. I ended up winning second place, nice. which I was super proud of. And as it went on, they just decided that like an event wasn't something that they wanted to pursue, which was fine. I totally understood it. Events are really, really hard. The newspaper at the time had started up doing – they were doing like a news podcast – And um, one of my friends there was going to start a beer podcast. And he was like, "Um, do you want to do a podcast about your porn books? Oh, my God. And I was like, "Um, you know that I do. And they're not (laughs) porn books. But yes. Do you mean romance novels? Do you want me to do a podcast about romance novels? Why, yes. Thank you. Exactly. So um, I did. And I think So the guy that started the beer podcast, he actually ended up coming on and did two episodes with me. His name is Chris, and he's really fantastic. And I think one of the best things about it, obviously not just being able to talk to people about books and have fun with that, was that I got to do some education with the people that I worked with on romance novels and 
who reads them and that they're not porn Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so, you know, I hate on one sense that we have to do that. Yeah. But I also really enjoy it. Yeah, no, and it's and it's something. Well, okay. First of all, clearly you can pitch yourself and your projects. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kelly. <laughs> I mean, second place and a podcast. That sounds like you did a pretty great job to me. But yeah, no. I mean, secondly, that is something that you know. Obviously, we don't want to have to talk about, but you know, we if we do talk about it, and you know, are saying okay, well, let's actually, you know, discuss the misinformation you've been given about this genre. Then, you know, hopefully somebody leaves a little more enlightened. Right. And it was also, like, refreshing because one of the gals that I worked with, she was out of college for a couple of years, and she was like, oh, yeah, I used to write stories about erotica. Like, it was like a college class she was taking or something. And so it kind of normalized us being able to talk about these things versus having to, like, whisper about them because there's nothing wrong. I mean, obviously, you're not going to read erotica at work. But if we're having a conversation about things that are in society, <laughs> it's yeah. it's a part of the world. And it shouldn't be shameful, you know, like, of course, use discretion and all that. But it's not something that we should have to be ashamed of saying that I enjoy reading books that are about love, but also they have sex in them. Um, (laughs) You know, and maybe some people they don't want the sex in them. That's fine. too. That's okay. We've got options in romance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right, right. And it's not all you know, romance isn't a monolith, so. <laughs> right, right. No, it's, yeah. uh, you know, what? it's so funny. Um, I, I think about one of the, one of the first times I remember friends finding out about me reading romance, because of course now I'm, I'm, you know, more than happy to make recommendations and read. I read my books publicly, like I don't hide the mm-hmm. covers, but I feel like everybody goes through that, that period of time where you you do, you know, shield the cover of your book or you cradle the Kindle closer to your body. And so for me, one of the earliest memories I have of people knowing that I read romance was I was rehearsing for a play and I had a book on the side of the stage with me, like while I was waiting to go on. And I came off of stage to find one of the guys from my cast enact reenacting um, and overacting the the sex scenes from the book, mm. like to several people surrounding him, like giggling, like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. I can't believe this isn't a book. Oh, my God, this is so dirty. And I just was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is so stupid. Like, why is this happening? And mm-hmm. I think the the opposite end of that was it was probably the same Around the same time, maybe maybe a few weeks later, I was sitting in the theater green room reading another book, and one of my professors who I've I idolized, I she's one of the smartest women I've ever known, you know, went to school for years, I think has two PhDs, like ridiculously brilliant. She walks in, notices what I'm reading, and says, Oh, Lori Foster, I love her books too. And Mm. that was like the moment that it clicked for me that, oh, my God, it's okay for me to read these. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. And smart people read romance like this is Mm -hmm. this is a genre written by brilliant people and it it can be read by brilliant people as well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So that was my moment. Yeah, I had I mean, like before. Before I did my presentation, I wasn't really open about it, but like I remember the summer before I had told my sister and uh, that I was reading romance and you know, I had been like a devotee of reading Dear Author every day in Smart Bitch Smart Bitches Trashy Books. Mm, yes. And I just was like, okay, first of all, Sarah Wendell is like my idol. <laughs> She's the best. And you know what? She's such a sweet person too. She is the nicest. She is. And when I was researching my event, because she lives in Maryland, but she didn't at the time. She was living, I think, in New York. 
And I had emailed her and was like, hey, I'm a reader of the blog. I'm thinking about doing these things. You know, do you have any, can I ask you a few questions? And she answered every question I had Mm. and was like, I'm getting ready to move to Maryland. If you have more questions, let me know, blah, blah, blah. And so that has that's something that I've carried with me since I've like been yeah. public, if you will, that I I'm here to help anybody else with anything. You know, like if I have the answers, I'll help you. If not, I will try to find you somebody that does because I feel like I got to I'm nowhere, but you know what I mean? Like I made a small name for myself yeah. because other people helped me. So I love to help other people. <laughs> yeah. No, same here. And that's, that's why it's the same within, I think both within romance landia, but also within like, um, the podcasting world as well is, mm-hmm. you know, I, I learned very early on when I started podcasting that it was so much more beneficial, uh, you know, not only in terms of like the amount of listeners, but also just more beneficial, like emotionally and personally, mm-hmm. like to lift each other up and promote right. each other's podcasts, as opposed to thinking of ourselves as competitors. Like even, even if we were all romance podcasters, like I love to promote my fellow romance podcasters mm-hmm. because we're all out here trying to do the same. We're all, we all have the common goal and that's to spread the love for the genre that we love. And right. you know, what, what's, how's it going to do any good to put anybody down? It doesn't. Right. You know, and I think about that a lot. I'm like, there's, we're not competition. Oh, and have you ever seen that? It's um, like between the sheets or something, that documentary. You know, I haven't. And somebody just brought that up again on Twitter recently. And I was like, oh, that's right. I meant to watch that. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. It's, it's pretty, it's kind of outdated at this point, but the, the overall idea is really good. But in there, um, they like interview Beverly Jenkins and she's like at, I, if I remember this correctly, she's like at one of the RWA conferences Okay, and she says something like there's room for everybody here. And I was like, oh my gosh, there is. And so that's like, yeah, that's like how I see it. Like there's room for all of us. We we all bring something different. Yeah. And I don't – we're not competition. We're all just here to help each other. So, so anyway. true. Well, and speaking of Beverly Jenkins, I I realized the other day that I haven't read a Beverly Jenkins for the podcast yet, and I feel like I need to remedy that. Like A-S-A-P. Yes. I was actually talking to a friend who's going to be a, a upcoming guest on the podcast, and she – she was telling me that, oh, you know, I don't usually, I don't usually read romance because I, you know, as a black woman, I'm looking more for like the black experience in my books. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh girl, well, let me, let me hook you up with some of my favorite, you know, black authors. Um, Here are authors writing, um, you know, specifically black romance. Here are some writing interracial Mm -hmm. romance. And we talked about Beverly Jenkins and she said, you know, I actually, sent a like DM to Beverly Jenkins like a few years ago. Just I like I barely knew who she was. I just read something she wrote on Twitter, I think, thought it was so brilliant. And I messaged her and we started this like, you know, back and forth rapport Mm -hmm. of like me asking her questions and her just being so nice enough to answer them. And I had no idea that she was so high up in the world of what she does. And I was like, that just goes to show you what a great person she is. Like the fact that she's willing to just message somebody and answer their questions and, you know, start this super sweet uh, conversation online. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) It's it's pretty awesome. This community, we're not perfect. No. This community is not perfect, but I feel like it has a lot of really great strengths yeah, And as long as we continue to work on those strengths and then also work on the things that aren't so great, right? we're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's all you can hope for, right? You know, in the best yep. of families, like there's always, there's always room to grow. Sometimes we're just a little too stubborn to admit right. when we need to make those changes, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all yes. with good intention. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> 
Well, Keeney, let me ask, do you have a specific book or books that you're most looking forward to reading this year? Um, oh my gosh. Okay. So in April, I've already read it. I need to read a finished copy, but um Twice Shy by Sarah Hogel. Okay. So I absolutely loved You Deserve Each Other. Um, favorite book from last year. It was a so, good one. Yeah. The second one is like really tender mm. and soft. And I think it's like what I really needed this year. Mm. Um, oh my gosh. You know, I'm like encyclopedic with books until somebody asks right, me. Right. Of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really looking forward to the new Sally Thorne. Oh yeah, that's right. That when does that come out? Do we I think in May. Okay. Um, and then um I really want to read that the second Pharaoh Rashan book, the dating playbook. Oh yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, and then Forever also tar- they released that um the cover of that Quana Jackson, the Keanu Reeves. Oh my I wanna marry Keanu Keanu Reeves. I really wanna read that. I just that's one of the ones where like just the title, like if you had just told me the title of the book, I'd say, Yep, gonna read it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And I'm sure there's a ton more. Um, I'm just blanking out. And, right. you know, I I love um, I love illustrated covers. I love mm-hmm. people covers. Mm-hmm. I just love books. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll take them all. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, and April is a great month for romance releases, I must say. Like, there are several awesome books that I I was lucky enough to read, you know, early copies of that come out this month. So I think um, there's a lot to look forward to just in Mm -hmm. terms of April reading. Yes, I'm sure. And um, so for any readers, I'm just going to plug this totally unpaid. But if any (laughs) readers haven't already read Hot Copy by Ruby Barrett, Go ahead and get on that. There's some content warnings, so look those up. But it is super hot. I forgot how hot Karina lets their books be. So funny that you mentioned that one because guess what book is next up in my TBR pile? (laughs) Actually, by the time this episode comes out, I probably have, you know, sped read through it already. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Look, I'm just going to say that there's some face sitting in that book. Oh, girl, Mm -hmm. you're speaking my language. (laughs) (laughs) I know what the people like. (laughs) It's so true. Oh, my gosh. That's great. Well, Keeney, where can everybody find and follow you for all your reviews and what's coming up next? So you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at KeeneyLay1. And I talk about books mostly on Twitter. On Instagram, I mostly talk about my cat and post pictures of her <laughs> and my stories. Love it. Um, so that's my main place right now. I've been posting some reviews for um, Goodreads. Mm-hmm. And eventually, I hope to have another podcast, but I just haven't launched it yet. Hey, that's okay. In the meantime, people can check out, you know, the yep. romance romp on their, you know, favorite podcast streaming platform. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's still there. So that's fantastic. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, of course. So let's get down to business because okay. I am so excited. And I know you are too, to talk yes. about this book today. So today's book is The Intimacy Experiment by Rosie Dannon. And this contemporary would we call it friends to lovers? Um, I think so. I think so too. Or like um work acquaintances to lovers. <laughs> yes. Uh in any case, this book was published just this month, April 2021. It's available on Amazon for 9.99 Kindle edition. Although these books are so gorgeous. This is one where if you didn't get an early copy, I would swoop in and pick up that paperback copy. Like, no no problem. Um, and Keeney and I were blessed enough to receive advanced copies of this book. So thank you for that. Um, now, this this book also, I will say, it's not a – it's not necessarily – I don't know if I want to say it's part of a series, but it's, it's the follow-up to Rosie Dannon's The Roommate, which came out last year and – really took the world by storm, wouldn't you say? I would say, yes. It was very popular. I found it on a lot of like, 
you know, most uh, anticipated books to read in 2020 and also in like the roundup of the year, like best books of the year. So Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't read The Roommate, you absolutely can still read The Intimacy Experiment on its own. However, I do think they make a great package deal together. And um, if you listen to our steamy spotlight interview with Rosie last month, you know that she'll agree. She recommends that you read them together. However, um, you know, again, read whatever interests you the most. So um, if you haven't listened to my episode with Rosie yet, I highly recommend checking it out. We had a lot of fun talking about these books and also what she's got coming up in the near future. So um, give that a listen. But let me give everybody the brief synopsis for The Intimacy Experiment, and then Keeney and I will jump on into our review. So here we go. Naomi Grant has built a life around going against the grain. When the sex-positive startup she co-founded becomes an international sensation, her responsibilities shift from the bedroom to the boardroom. Ready to conquer new worlds, Naomi wants to extend her educational platform to live lecturing. But despite her long list of qualifications, higher ed won't hire her. Ethan Cohen has recently received two honors. LA Mag named him one of the city's hottest bachelors, and he became rabbi of his own synagogue. Taking a gamble in an effort to attract more millennials to the faith, the executive board hired Ethan because of his non-traditional background. Unfortunately, his temple is low on both funds and congregants. The board gives him three months to turn things around or else they'll close the doors of his synagogue for good. Naomi and Ethan join forces to host a buzzy seminar series on modern intimacy, the perfect solution to their problems, until they discover a new one, their growing attraction to each other. They've built the syllabus for love's latest experiment, but neither of them expected that they'd be the ones putting it to the test. Ooh, I love that last sentence. They've built the syllabus for love's latest experiment. That's what beautiful. I love it. Oh, man. Yeah. Big, big round of applause to whoever wrote that at Berkeley. Yeah. (laughs) It's true. There's an art to writing these synopses. There are. I am notorious for not reading the whole blurb. So you're like reading that. And I was like, (laughs) wow, I've not heard that. (laughs) (laughs) But I think it's a great – I really do. um, So many times – My guests for the podcast, you know, they just read what I tell them to read. And Mm. it's the same thing. They don't, they don't read the synopsis. And so when they hear it for the first time on the podcast, they, you know, sometimes have qualms with, oh, well, that's not, that's not how the book really went. Mm -hmm. Or if I had read that, I would have been disappointed by what I was given. And Mm -hmm. I think this one's a pretty accurate description of what you're getting into, at least as far as setting the book up. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right, Keeney. So hit me with it, your overall impressions. Okay. So first of all, I dropped everything when I got the widget for this book (laughs) to read it. I read it a a while ago, but I absolutely loved it. I think I read it like not in one sitting, but in like two. Yeah. And I think that Rosie just has a really fresh um, writing style, a really great voice. Um, you know, it's hot. It's it. She tackles a lot of things in it, but not mm-hmm. like overly so. Um, I I just really enjoyed it. I thought that the title, the intimacy experience, uh, or experiment, excuse me, it really speaks to what is happening in the book yeah um you know and really talks about intimacy and so that that was um that was really good and I think um you know kind of what we were talking about earlier a lot of times people think romance books are one thing Mm -hmm. and there are there are many many different things but I think even just with that title and to us to me as a reader I'll just speak for me it's it's nice to see a book that really hones in on like the intimacy of it and not the sex there's a lot of sex in it but um 
you know, and kind of like just a reminder to us, to me as a reader, really what I'm looking for in a book is the intimacy between the characters. And um, a lot of times that shows on page as sex, Mm -hmm. Um, not always, but that's really for me as a reader, what's important to see. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. In fact, there's, there's a part closer to the end, um, when I think, I think it's during the final, the final, one of the final scenes when Ethan is in their little, the bar that they've like hung out in before. Mm -hmm. And he's basically giving the last, you know, the, the, what what do you call it? The last seminar in this series. Mm -hmm. And, he he I think is the one to say, look, you know, whether they cancel me, they cancel the series, they cancel, you know, the synagogue completely. This has always been about intimacy, not sex. Like, mm-hmm. and I think that distinction is something that not only we don't talk about enough in romance novels, but I think it's also something that we've sort of lost in the modern world of dating. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I found that really interesting because I, for one, you know, as a single woman millennial, I think I would be like, <laughs> I'll be, I'm not Jewish, but I feel like I would be like the target demographic for a series like this. Uh, and this is a seminar series that I absolutely would love to attend because mm-hmm. I just, I just don't see intimacy in dating today. It's very transactional. It's very, you know, swipe left, swipe right, you know, meet here, do this, leave, goodbye. Like, so Mm -hmm. I, I personally loved the whole idea of the seminar series throughout. And then the fact that it kind of, you know, dictates um, or mirrors the relationship that, Naomi and Ethan are also building I thought was very sweet and Mm -hmm. I think this is a seminar series that needs to happen so Rosie you've got some work to do (laughs) yeah I mean as I'm a Gen Xer but Mm -hmm. yes also single woman who attempts to date and it is it's 100% 100% transactional. Yeah. And it's like, this is so stupid. <laughs> it is. And you know what? I really, I really do think that I don't know if it's going to be for the better or the worse, but dating is going to change because of the pandemic. Like, I mm-hmm. know it. I see it happening already. And it's going to be interesting to see which direction it goes. And this was something I talked about a little bit in my interview with Rosie is just sort of like, okay, because of this time where we've all been stuck at home, is it either going to turn into a giant orgy fuck fest after the pandemic where everybody's just out trying to get theirs? Or are people going to be a lot more cautious when dating? Are people going to take more time to maybe get to know somebody over a phone conversation or, you know, Zoom before meeting in person, before inviting Mm -hmm. them to bed with them. And so I'm, I'm really interested to see both in my personal life (laughs) and also just sort of like in books and media, like how, how we navigate the new world of dating post pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be really, really interesting to see. So yeah, you and I will be waiting for that. Rosie, yes, call ma'am. us. We'll be- <laughs> <laughs> we will sign up for that. And can you imagine, like, I mean, if if she even branded it as like Rosie Dannon's um, intimacy experiment, like seminar series, like the amount of people that would sign up for this, mm, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it would be huge. Yeah, it would it be would huge. Be. Um, it would be. But in the meantime, that's that's for a future yeah. discussion mm-hmm. with um, mm-hmm. Rosie, hopefully. But uh, yeah, let's first of all, we have to talk about Naomi Grant because, yes. oh, this woman, what a boss. Right. So you talked about it earlier with the blurb and like reading the first book. And I agree that it's not necessary. But I think knowing Naomi from book one kind of yeah. helps set the stage for book two. So she is... She's a badass boss bitch. Mm -hmm. And, but she's also like fragile. Yeah. (laughs) But she doesn't want anybody to know that. So she tries real hard to be Naomi 
Mm -hmm. and everything that that means to her and because she's worked in the sex industry as a sex worker you know people have like a preconceived notion of her and it's just right so when I was saying that like Rosie does a lot of things in this book so she's kind of like talking about sex workers and how we society as a we Mm -hmm. tend to treat them and you know, and kind of like breaking out of that mold, which I think we're getting as a society more aware of, you know, those, you know, trying to do away with those tropes about like what sex work is and um, who those people are. They're just regular people like, uh, like everybody else, you know. Yeah. You just have to visit OnlyFans.com once to understand like the wide scope of sex work. Right. And, you know, sex work is work and it pays the bills and, hey, good, whatever, you know, whatever works for anybody else. But so Naomi's really going through a lot and yeah. she really wants to be a teacher and an educator. And it just because she's – because other people are carrying that baggage, it's making it hard for her. And so that's how she kind of links up with um, Ethan for this course. And it just, yeah, like they build that intimacy and it's great. And I also want to talk about her faith exploration. I found that really fascinating because I feel like we don't, at least in my experience with breeding romance, it, you don't usually get to explore faith in Rome. And I think it's because in, you know, a lot of Western religion, it's been taught from an early age that, you know, sex is bad, sex is dirty, like, you know, you're a sinner. And so what I really loved about this book is how Rosie did explore faith, um, you know, through both of her characters, somebody Mm -hmm. who's a devout, you know, rabbi, um, to, you know, also Naomi, who's rediscovering her faith. And mm-hmm. I I found that fascinating. I, one of the things that I absolutely love, and I, because we don't see it a lot, I wish we saw it more, was people exploring their faith. Yeah. I think it's a thing that a lot of people think about and struggle with. Mm-hmm. And because we are so like Christian based, right? So yeah. I kind of like the underlying is that most people we read, we're reading about Christian or Christian based people. So, but there are, there have been a few books where they kind of explore that. Like, what does that mean to me as a person? How does that intersect with my being a sexual person? Mm-hmm. Um, which is a lot of what Rosie did in this book. And I just think that I would love to see more of that because we, especially as we start to see people, characters that are more based in reality, right? Like, yeah, that is a thing that people struggle with. And I'm not talking about like inspirational romance. That's a whole other thing. I don't read inspi. I don't need, I don't read inspi. I'm glad that it's there for people that want it. It's not for me. But the ones that kind of explore this to be like, what does this mean to me? How can I be, in Naomi's case, how can I be a sex worker, former sex worker, a sex educator, somebody who is very sexual and also have a deep relationship with my faith and my God in this case, you know? So it's, I just really like it. I do too, because they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I think- I think that's the idea that we've been given, you know, not only in in books, but also in the world. And Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I would love to see – I mean, first of all, I love to see more more Judaism in books. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see more – more religions outside of, you know, Christianity celebrated in romance. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, no, I I really enjoyed it because I've never been – I've never been, uh, you know, I was never ra- raised religiously, and so it's never been a part of my life, but I really do find religion so fascinating, like, and mm-hmm. all the different, all the different facets of religion, and so I I really enjoyed the fact that she was, you know, trying to 
rediscover her faith and taking classes and you know she also talks about going to therapy which I very much appreciated um because obviously she's dealing with a lot of demons and so yeah this I I there were a lot of and these are all smaller components like that I just think build such a well-rounded character yeah I mean she's very both of them are very well-rounded yeah you know she's trying to think about who she is as somebody who isn't actively doing sex work but is like sex work adjacent Mm -hmm. and you know how that fits into the business person that she wants to be and all of that you know as well as like her faith as well as you know so a lot of things are happening there and um you know I think some books this was very much like Naomi's journey but also theirs together sometimes it's like really heroin focused yeah um but I think this was a good mix of both of them um finding their paths and then together as well as opposed to like sometimes it's really just focused on the two of them which I enjoy a lot of those books as well um but you know Naomi had a lot of growth here and it was really great to read Yeah, and honestly, there's nothing sexier to me than reading a romance where we see the characters growing individually as well as a a Mm -hmm. couple like that. Because I think that's really important in, you know, not in (laughs) real relationships, not fictional ones as well Mm -hmm. as like we need to grow individually as well as with our partner or partners. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I did. I did like seeing that a lot and how how supportive Ethan and Naomi were of each other's personal growth as well Mm -hmm. as, you know, growing as a couple. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think now's the perfect time for us to take a quick break. And before you know it, Keeney and I will be back to discuss our lovable hero, Ethan. So should we talk about Ethan? Oh, can we? Because (laughs) he is the cinnamon roll hero of my dreams Mm -hmm. that also gets down in the bedroom oh my god Mm -hmm. I love me some Ethan (laughs) one of my friends messaged me and she was like I'm reading the intimacy experience and I was like oh my gosh Ethan experiment Ethan is like so swoon worthy he's Mm -hmm. like like you said cinnamon roll but also like gets down and like he's you know, he's like uncertain too. Yeah. Uh, but also, like, there's some things that he is just like, no, this is it. And it's just like, yes. <laughs> I loved him. I think my favorite surprise about Ethan was when they were playing the softball game and it's revealed that he's like super competitive and is like, I do not like to lose. I was like, Mm -hmm. oh my God, you're taking this man who like up until this point has just been like so ooey gooey and like so unsure of himself and like mumbling his words when he's around Naomi because she's just so sexy and Mm -hmm. sure of herself. And now he's he's the softball player and coach that's just like, we are not losing this game. Right, right. (laughs) And I think also one really good thing I really enjoyed about Ethan is like he really saw Naomi, right? Like Yes. From the beginning, he saw her as a whole person, not as somebody who had done sex work, not as somebody who was an educator, you know, not as somebody who was struggling with her faith. He saw, you know, not as those like silos. He saw her as a whole person who had done good things and bad things, who will continue to do good things and bad things, and, you know... And that's so refreshing. And I know this is going to sound like so corny, Mm -hmm. but also he notices that Naomi is left-handed. Oh, my God. I noted that, too, because that's also in the softball scene where he's like, oh, you can't use that glove. You're left-handed. And she's like, oh, that's interesting that you noticed that about me, but okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So for me, I'm left-handed. And so when – but again, it's like one of those things where like 
ninety percent of the population, I don't know if that number is right, are right handed. <laughs> yeah. So the assumption is that everybody is right handed. Right. So when somebody is paying attention and notices that you're left handed, it's kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. Like, oh wow. Wow. You know, so like for me that was like, oh shit. <laughs> I know. I thought I thought that was pretty great. I also What I loved about both this book and The Roommate is how it it feels very modern. Like, it feels very 2021 in the way that people have relationships, in the way that people respond to different things. Like, we have Naomi, who, you know, I think she's described as bisexual. However, I kind of read her as pansexual because she said she's attracted to people of all genders. And... Mm. And you have Ethan who, you know, any, they they run into her ex-girlfriend when they're out and he's like, oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and he knows she does sex work. He has no problem meeting, you know, not only her ex-boyfriend, but somebody that she's performed sex on screen with, Josh. Mm -hmm. And I just, I loved how, how adaptable he was to like any situation, any part of her world he embraced her no matter what and he was he was willing to be there for her like mm-hmm. i that's i think what i would look for in an ideal partner is somebody who doesn't you know balk at every little thing um and even the big things i mean he's he's on board with her from the get go right yeah yeah and you know he makes choices for himself. Yep. But also looks at it as like, okay, this is the person that I want to be with. And so these are the things that I need to do, not only for myself, mostly for myself, but also because it's right, it's the right thing to do for my partner. Yeah. Yeah. No, he is a, uh, He's a he's a hero to remember. Um he is. as is as is Naomi. Um mm-hmm. and you know what I actually I just posted my um I just posted my Goodreads review for for the intimacy experiment. Um again, this, you know, episode is coming out a little bit after we record. So, um but one of the things these are all things that I noted in my review. I said, "Okay, what's not to love about this book? We've got this heroine who is a badass. She's a businesswoman. She's a sex worker. She's unapologetic. We've got this hero. He's squishy. He's a cinnamon roll, but he's also not afraid to explore new things. He's all about, you know, his partner in the bedroom. And then my third thing that I said I really loved was the fact that and maybe this is this is so small, but for me this is important. I love Naomi's lasting friendship with Josh. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's something that I feel like we don't see enough of in romance as well is I would love to see more friendships between men and women. Mm -hmm. That that's something that stood out to me is I there's, you know, obviously we know that Naomi's kind of developed this friendship um, with the heroine from the roommate who is with Josh at this point. But I love that, you know, she's she's willing to sit down and talk with Josh, her ex and, mm-hmm. you know, her business partner. Like, I love that they're still friends because there is not there are not enough friendships on screen between men and women, um, because more often than not, they turn into relationships or flirtations or, mm-hmm. you know, somebody pining after somebody else. And I love all of that stuff. Don't get me wrong. But. I am here for the platonic friendships as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like in general, we don't see enough adult friendships in media. Um, It's really focused on um, – especially – okay, so I probably read and watch mostly things that – are like romantic in nature, right? Mm-hmm. So I understand why more focus would be like on love interests, but there's just not enough in 
in any sort of media, uh, particularly about female friendships, healthy female friendships. Yeah. Um, I think we also don't see enough of healthy male relationships, friendships. I don't think we do either. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So all of it is really tied together. But yeah, that's that you're right. Like Rosie does a really good job of like, there's no jealousy. I think even in Mm -hmm. the first book, there's a little bit of the heroine, um, like thinking about Naomi, but more in just like, wow, Josh has had the opportunity to be with this amazing woman. Right. And I'm just like this nobody girl, mm-hmm. not like, oh, my God, she, you know, it's more of a she, Clara, she sees Naomi as like this really vibrant person. Yeah. And she thinks like, oh, that's not who I am. That's not, not like, me. Why would he want me compared right. to her? Right. And it's not like, oh, my God, he's had sex with her. It's more just like, she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> What am I? You know, I mean, Claire's also amazing, but it's just one of those things where you like look at somebody and are like, wow, yeah. she's. I want to be her like, when right. I grow up. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the fact that Naomi and Josh can still ha- have a friendship and neither Clara nor Ethan are concerned about it, you know? Yeah. They're I, like, oh, that's, yeah. that's what I love because I, I am not. One of my least favorite tropes to read or watch is any kind of love triangle, love square. Like I am, oh God, it just, it annoys me to no end. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are people out there writing it and writing it well, but it's not for me because I just, I don't know. It just, it just really bothers me because I, I love I love the idea of people being able to respect their partner's boundaries and mm-hmm. also, you know, have faith in them and knowing they're not they're not going to cheat on me with, mm-hmm. you know, somebody just because it's someone of the gender that they're attracted to. <laughs> right. And OK, so we both know that there's a difference between fiction and real life, right? (laughs) But I think that when, for me as a person, I can say this about me, that when I'm reading these fictional accounts of relationships that work well, Mm -hmm. I can say to myself, I can help identify things that I would like to have in a relationship that I feel is important to me, right? And so when you see something like this and it feels good as a reader as a single reader, I can say, wow, I really would like to make sure that I find a partner that values my friends Yes, and values those relationships, even if I have opposite gendered friends or something like that. Right. Yeah. And like, because we start to, we start to model the things that feel good to us, like as we learn about them. So, you know, for those people that are like, well, they're just, they're not real. Well, they're not real, but they also can help us learn some healthier things that maybe if we weren't exposed to them before, yes, we're exposed to them now. And we can say, wow, you know, Naomi really liked that about him. Maybe I would really like that about somebody. They're a model for something, Mm -hmm. for something real. And, and that's, and that's why um, I feel like, I feel like in several episodes this season, we've talked about how, you know, it might be something we identify uh, with the the constant miscommunication that we see in romances, or it, it, it might be something that we noticed one character do, where we found ourselves saying, I expect more in 2021. Like, I expect mm-hmm. us to be setting a new standard. And I think it's for reasons like this that you're talking about, Keeney, in that If we put that in our books and we put that in the media that we're consuming, if we're creating what we want to see in the world, people will read it and watch it and they will interpret it as a model for how they can improve their own relationships as Mm -hmm. well. And so that's that's why I think, you know, for anybody that ever says, oh, this isn't real or people who, you know, expect romance novels to be their reality are like dreaming I I just want them to think about that idea that, well, that's fair. We understand that this is fiction, but also, (laughs) 
you know, think about every movie you watch and show you watch and book you read and album you Mm -hmm. listen to. We apply so much of the media we consume to our own lives and our Mm -hmm. own relationships. So what we want to see, the authors have the power to put that into their books. Mm Mm-hmm. They do. And I'm so, you know, when I started reading, there was like a lot of like alphas. Yes, First of ma'am. All, to, to be clear, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I read contemporary almost exclusively. So when I talk about what I read, I'm talking about mostly in contemporary. So okay. other things happen in historical and PNR and all that. But when I started reading romance really heavily, there was a lot of alpha holes, mm-hmm. alphas. And I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I loved it. I love a good alpha hole. Talk to me about Kristen Ashley. We're good, you know. (laughs) But over the last few years, like, we've really started to see this turn to these kind of, like, softer, um, gentler cinnamon rolls, heroes, where they get shit done. Don't get, you know (laughs) – They get shit done. But also, you know, they're better at communicating. Yeah. Typically, um, you know, sometimes they talk, you know, it's just a different type of thing. And those for me, I'm like, this is the type of hero that I want in my life, you know, hero. But or partner. But again, it's like kind of like that modeling because in real life, an alpha type person, I w- wouldn't work for me. Yeah. <laughs> so I love this kind of these soft. I, I still read here our alpha heroes. Oh, but me too. Yeah, and and I enjoy them for what they are. Same yeah. with the cinnamon roll types, but it's just it's just different. And I I've enjoyed this kind of shift. And mm-hmm. with anything, it'll shift to something else, and then something else, and you yeah, know, yeah, the world is always changing. So mm-hmm. of course, our perspectives and the media that reflects our perspectives is also changing as well. So I right. mean, yeah, it, it, I always try to think about. Um, what's coming next you know like I mean it feels like it was yesterday but really it was a couple years ago when I sat down with Sky McDonald and we made a YouTube video discussing the you know the new trend in in romance novel covers of having illustrated covers and and now it's everywhere I mean it, it's mm-hmm. it's almost harder to find a book without an illustrated cover than it is you know, to find one. And so now I'm just thinking, okay, what's next? What's Mm going to be the next cover that we're all arguing about on Twitter? (laughs) (laughs) It'll be something. It'll be something. Exactly. Oh, gosh. But yeah, no, I, I love, I love that things are changing. And look, there is something, this is what I tell everybody. There's something for everyone. If you Mm -hmm. want the alpha hero, you've got it. If you want the cinnamon roll hero, there's plenty of that too. And Mm -hmm. um, I'm with you. I almost exclusively read contemporary, although I am trying to read more historical this year as well. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there's something for everyone. You just have to be willing to look and or Ask the right person, wink, mm-hmm. wink, nudge, nudge, right. to, <laughs> to recommend one to you. But, Keeney, any other thoughts you have before we maybe move on to the segzerpt portion of the episode? No, nope, no more thoughts. I'm ready for the segzerpt. 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 Yes. I know. It's it's great. Yes. I need a, I need a like, petition to have it added to the dictionary. Mm-hmm. But, um, okay, well... Do you have a favorite sexy moment from this book? I do. So I have just a line, but just to quickly set it up. So Ethan and Naomi have been – it's probably about halfway in the book. So they've been working on the intimacy series. They've had a couple of classes. She's feeling pretty attracted to him, but she's also very conflicted because he's a rabbi. Mm -hmm. And so she's not really sure, like – um, she's basically thinking about whether or not she's going to have sex with him, right? Yes. So he's, Ethan says, um, Ethan thought for a moment. Okay, how about this? I'm a man, he said, each syllable calm and clearly articulated, and I'm going to fuck you. Mm. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
that I, for me, I felt like was just, like I said, like he's soft and he's, you know, thoughtful and he has all these things, but he's also like, Naomi, I am going to fuck you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> pretty, pretty great. And you know what I do love? Um, and I, I have a sex herb as well, but one of the things I do love is that the first time they they like plan to have sex together or like it's implied that they're about to have sex, Naomi kind of freaks out a little bit. Like she mm-hmm. she is, you know, sort of realizing and I think this is something that so many people experience as well, is just okay, I'm here, you know, I've had sex with plenty of people. I know what I'm doing. Why am why is this not the right time? Like he's mm-hmm. perfect. I like him. He's gorgeous. He's doing all the right things. I know that I want to have sex with him, but why is this not working right now? Mm-hmm. And I love that because I said early in the year that one of the things I want to see more of in romance is like awkward missteps in sex scenes because mm-hmm. for me it makes it so much more real. Is like Let's try something. Mm, you know what? This doesn't work for me. I don't like this position. Let's do something else. Like, And yeah. so the fact that he also can recognize that she's not into it, I mm-hmm. was like, oh, my God, love you even more. And then yes. when they do get to have sex, you know, it makes it even worse. It makes it more worth it. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, because she's like, she's trying to figure out all those things. And it's also, I'm not sure if you've ever read that book, Come As You Are by Emily Nagowski. You know, I haven't. It's been recommended to me, though. If you get a chance, it's a good listen. I listen to it, but it talks about like how a lot of women or women type people, they'll have like what she, what she refers to as breaks, right? So mm-hmm. even though everything else is good, for whatever reason, her body put the brakes on it. And it's just like, mm. this isn't, this isn't for me right now. And, and that's okay. Right. Like that, that's yeah. totally okay. And it's normal even, but so to see it in here and then Ethan is just like, okay, great. This isn't the right time. And that's okay. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, let's I'm see. Ready. I'm ready. Um, I mean, it's it's hard deciding where to start with this mm-hmm. one because, okay, I do like this. This is when he's fingering her. So mm. we'll start here. Who doesn't love a good, you know, fingering? Right. But here we go. Wrapping one hand around his wrist, she held him steady while she fucked herself on his hand. Nicer than that. He let her ride his fingers for a while, using his mouth on her clit. When she started whimpering so close she could taste it, he knocked her hand aside and pulled her toward his face, kissing her pussy so well that her thighs shook and her knees locked. She couldn't believe she ever thought he was safe. Naomi came when he slid two fingers inside her, his thumb whispering across her asshole because, wow, the shock of that, (laughs) the barest suggestion that someday he might want to, yeah, she fucking came. (laughs) I mean, Rosie writes, like, amazing sex scenes. You know, and I love, I love reading, here's the thing about romance is, as Many people who say, oh, it's the same thing every time. It's really not. And the reason is because there's so many incredible writers who all have their own voices. And what I love about Rosie's voice is that it's it's playful, um, it's fun, but it's also very smart and thoughtful and vulnerable. Like there, there's so many components in Rosie's writing and... I love reading sex scenes that are both hot and fun. Like, I Mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's what I want. Right. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, how many times can you read, you know, insert a into tab B or whatever. (laughs) And it's just like, okay, okay. But um, yeah. So make it interesting, make it different, make it fun, make it hot. And there's, you know, I'm not a writer, but there's so many different ways to do it. And Rosie does it very well. You know, I feel like 
I've never read a romance where somebody has said insert A into tab B because Mm. that (laughs) maybe that, you know, this month we're talking all about how science is sexy in romance novels and that's missing from my sexy science romances. (laughs) Insert tab A into B. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. You're welcome. (laughs) Just inspiration. Yeah. I mean – you get the basic thing. Like, we all know what yes. it is, but like, you know, make it interesting, make it fun, make it, <laughs> you know, stop halfway, whatever. And we're like, okay, where's the rest? <laughs> I think I'd, I'd prefer tab B to some of the other euphemisms I've heard for vagina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he pushed into my tab B. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> my warm tab B. <laughs> Throbbing tab B. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. gosh. Do you have any? Do you have any particular like um, euphemisms that uh, drive you nuts when reading romance novels? I feel like everyone has their their breaking point. I the one that I cannot stand for some reason is I really like I really dislike when they say like he entered my sex. You're what? I mean, it works for some people, but I don't know why. Like, just say he entered me, okay? Like, I know what you mean, but. (laughs) Yeah, because if it's your ass, they're going to say that. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, that's not my favorite. Um, It's definitely, I don't think it's my least favorite, but it's definitely not at the top of my list. You know, uh, let me think. I feel like I feel like it changes. Like, you know what's so funny is when I first started reading romance, I did not like the word pussy at all, mm. and now I love it. So, mm-hmm. it's definitely not that. I happen to be a huge fan of the word cunt. Um I know lots of people don't like it. Mm-hmm. I happen to love it. But yeah, I don't you know what is weird is occasionally I've heard <laughs> I've heard someone describe a vagina as like her hot, like not her hot pocket, like the food hot pocket, but like, like her steaming like pocket or her slit, her slit. That's not my favorite either. But yeah, but anytime I see the word pocket, I just think of a hot pocket. So yeah, I mean, (laughs) what else would you think of? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So um, there's definitely plenty out there that don't work for me. But yeah, I'm happy to say there's lots of them that I also like. Same, same. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Keeney. Well, I think it's time to give this book a few grades as we okay. wrap up. So I am going to ask you to grade the intimacy experiment on okay. a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the very best that it could possibly be in three areas. And those are heart, humor, and heat. So okay. we will start with heart. What do you think? I say for heart, I would give it a 10. Yeah, I think this is going to be one where it's very high scores across the board. And yeah. I'm also going to give it a 10. <laughs> Easy peasy. All right. Yes. How about how about humor? So humor, I don't think maybe a 10. I think maybe like an 8. Like, it had some humorous scenes and there, like, the humor worked well. Yeah. But that wasn't, like, the overall theme of the book. I wouldn't say that this is, like, a rom-com. Who even knows what that means? We don't have to talk (laughs) about that. But I wouldn't say that this is, like, a rom-com. No, we're on the same page. I was thinking an eight as well. Um, And that's – and honestly, I – as humorous and entertaining as I find it, I do think there's a lot more, I don't know if I want to say drama, um, but like like personal mm-hmm. inner drama, turmoil, um, right. vulnerab- vulnerabilities. Like I think there's a lot more of that in this one than there was in The Roommate because Naomi has so many past demons and trauma mm-hmm. that she's dealing with. So Agreed. Yeah, so I do think um, that this one definitely has a little bit more of that, which makes it, you know, a little bit lower on the humor Mm -hmm. scale. Um, Entertaining, nonetheless. (laughs) Yes. And then there's the heat. What Mm -hmm. do you think? 
Um, I think I'm going to probably give that one a 10 as well. You know, I feel like anytime there's face sitting, it like bumps it up. (laughs) Um, So I'm going to go with 10. You know, here's the thing. I'm divided on this one because I love the face sitting. Mm-hmm. I I think the sex that they have is very, very hot. Mm-hmm. But could I have done with maybe one more sex scene? Absolutely. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to spoil it, but I should – we should probably mention that this is a little bit more of a slower burn. Yes. So, yes. Could they have maybe ramped it up a little bit? Maybe been a little faster of a burn? Absolutely. <laughs> but I still think it was like super hot. Yeah, and that's and that's part of the that's part of what divides me as well is that I do I love slow burn and I especially love slow burn when it makes sense. Like mm-hmm. I feel like in this one they're talking about intimacy, not sex, and they mm-hmm. are talking about Ethan and Naomi following the, you know, seminar series that she's created for intimacy. And so by the time they get to the part about you know, introducing sex into the relationship, it, it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, and so it's hard for me to say, like, I wanted them to have sex earlier. Like, of course I did. But at the same time, I think it made perfect sense that they waited as long as they did for their relationship. So Mm -hmm. on the one hand, I wanted more. On the other, I'm like, okay, I understand why there wasn't more rosy. Fine. Right. (laughs) I know. So I think I've got to give it a nine just okay. just just for my greedy, greedy heart wanting more. I understand. I understand. <laughs> now, this is typically the part of the podcast where I ask um, my newbie if they're interested in reading more romance in the future. But I'm going to take a wild guess and say that there's probably more romance in your future. Yes, I think that is a fair assumption. <laughs> How about this? Seeing as you're more of a more of a booby than a newbie, um, mm-hmm. what advice do you have to offer to maybe more more newbie readers to the genre? Sure. So I would say for a newbie a newbie reader to the genre, that if they want more, like let's say they read something and they really really like it, to ask a booby of the genre to help them find (laughs) more of that. Um, Because like you said, there is just so much out there. And I've said this on Twitter before, at least the people that I know on Twitter, we love to give recommendations. Yes. Nothing makes me happier as somebody who reads a lot of books than helping somebody else find more books that they love. Mm -hmm. So like, don't be afraid to ask for more recommendations. I think there's, there's lots of avenues, even if you're not on Twitter, there's a great, a great group on Reddit. Um, There's tons of Facebook groups, um, Instagram, obviously. So there's, there's tons of us out there. And I would say, you know, just know that you are not the only person reading romance. Cause I know like, I felt like for a long time, I was the only person, right. but there's, there's a ton of us and we're super proud of it. And as like a newbie, you should be proud of it too, because it's a great genre. I would also say, um, you know, try to, if you can, like get involved in some sort of community of Mm -hmm. romance readers. I think that that has been so helpful to me just like as a person to find friends in this community and, you know, friends that are like not just my internet friends anymore. (laughs) Yeah. Although I love, I love my internet friends. Um, Oh, me too. Absolutely. (laughs) But I will say I'm I'm with you. I think the beautiful thing about the romance genre is that there's a built-in community if you mm-hmm. want it. And that's something that, you know, as we're we're still dealing with this pandemic and so many people being at home, I think that's something that a lot of people are craving more than ever. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, no, there's community online, um, there's community in person. If you are seeing a lack of a romance community in your personal community, be the, you know, be the change you want to see. Like, start one, and I guarantee there will be more people near you that want to join because 
like Keeney said, I mean, there's so many of us out there. Some people just don't know where to start. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're starting a group or a a book club or whatever, I guarantee there will be people wanting to join and talk about romance with you because that's just, that's just how it works. We, we love Mm it. (laughs) Yep, we do. Um, one other quick note that I just want to, I wrote down a note because we were talking about the exploration of faith yes, and particularly Judaism in this book. Tamson Parker has a fantastic novella called Craving Flight. Okay. And the and the characters are Orthodox Jewish. So it's even more compl- – for them, their faith is even more complicated. Yeah. And um, they – she incorporates some BDSM in that book. Ooh. And it's just – it's so good, Kelly. It's so good. That sounds um, great. Yeah. It's fantastic. So for anybody who has read – or plans on reading um, the intimacy experiment, and they're looking for something else. I highly recommend Craving Flight. I love that, and I've read Tamsin Parker before, and really enjoyed, really enjoyed her work. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, no, that sounds fantastic. So, what mm-hmm. a great follow up to this yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. see, we're making we're making suggestions and book recs already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, That's how I do. Keeney, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you, Kelly. And we'll have to like do another episode about, you know, something else. Oh, always, because you know <laughs> that there's going to be plenty more books to talk about. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. Boobies and Newbies is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow Boobies and Newbies on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Boobies Podcast.